it's, it is my pleasure to be here also with um, most of the rest of the team uh, to talk about the social science prediction uh, framework at Ted Miguel um, introduced some of that today. Um, two years ago, we had a conference also with BITS where we brought together people to get inputs on what would it mean to uh, predict research results before they're known and some of the ways it could help. And two years later, um, we're very pleased that uh, we've been able to turn that into a platform that accepts submission, that already has had a dozen submissions, some of which have results. And what we want to do today, I get out of the way very quickly, um, he sort of have uh, Nick Otis first uh, that has done tremendous work on the platform to talk about uh, what does it mean to have a project up there and what will be the steps, who can do it, do you get feedback? So he's going to tell us um, where we are on that. Um, and then we're going to hear from two of the projects that have complete have run the platform and completed. Um, my copy, Eva Vival, that you know deserves so much credit for what's happening on this platform. We'll talk about one of the projects uh, that she's done with predictions, um, and she will tell us both about the substance as well as how uh, you know how the platform has the predictions have played into it. And our Advani will um, take it kind of later on another one of the projects that is around the platform. Um, we do so. Here's the format: we want to have 15 minutes for the presentations. And we'd like to have uh, 10 minutes at the end. So I'm going to be um, quite strict on the time. And uh, we are going to postpone the questions for later. But please feel free to put them in the chat. Uh, last thing is in the chat, you will see there is a link to a Google Doc form where we'd like to collect um, any comments you might have on the platform based on what you hear. Maybe you've used it. Maybe you have some uh, thoughts that you'd like to convey in any case. And we might draw on that for possible questions later, or there will be food for thoughts for us later. Um, without further ado, uh, Nico, Otis, the floor is yours. Okay. So thank you for that introduction and for the opportunity to today. I'm going to be providing an overview of the social science prediction platform. This is a platform that we've been uh, developing to help streamline the collection of forecasts. And I want to start by um, providing an overview of how researchers interested in collecting forecasts usually interact with the platform. So the usual setup involves a researcher who has designed a study. The researcher then develops a forecasting survey in Qualtrics and uploads that survey onto the platform. Then somebody from the platform reviews the survey and approves it. The researcher then publishes and distributes the platform. And finally, when the study is complete, the researcher will provide the results from the study. So that's kind of a, a high level overview of uh, how the platform operates. Let me provide a brief motivation as to why we should be interested in collecting forecasts. So first motivation has to do with improving research designs. Imagine uh, the decision, which intervention do I select or which experimental condition should I run? Or a different scenario where you're trying to determine which, uh, what the right effect size is to use when conducting your power calculations. Well, these are both situations where it would be very useful to have additional information. And if forecasts are accurate, they can be a valuable source of that information. A second motivation has to do with hindsight bias and learning. So there's this kind of broad question, how much are we learning from social science research? And this question can be very challenging to answer because a lot of times our results seem obvious ex post. By collecting predictions ex ante, we have a kind of quantifiable way of showing how much new information studies are providing. A final motivation has to do with mitigating publication bias. So I don't need to uh, convince people here that publication bias is a, is a big problem and that um, you know, it's, it's very disconcerting that null results are harder to publish. Now imagine a scenario where you have a null result using traditional uh, statistical measures, but you have predictions from experts saying that an intervention or an experimental condition will have a large effect. All of a sudden, 
those null results could become more interesting and maybe more publishable. So that's why collect forecasts. Now, what types of social science research can be forecast? Well, broadly, most, most social science research results can, can be forecast. So far on the platform, we've had predictions of results from large field experiments, uh, including work from, from Ted Miguel and David McKenzie and, and many others. We've had predictions of the results from laboratory ex experiments, looking at things like uh, loss aversion in work by Colin Kammerer and uh, experimental replication in work by Kevin Munger. And we have uh, also some studies looking at broader uh, predictions of summary statistics from, uh, from, from other projects that uh, Arun and Ava will be talking more about in the next two presentations. So we launched this, the, the platform officially in July, 2020. Since the launch, we've had 13 projects. We have a total of 2,300 registered users. And these users have made around 8,000 forecasts. Who are these forecasters? The top right figure shows the, uh, the disciplines of the registered forecasters that we have so far. You can see that it's predominantly economists, but there's a, a reasonable representation of the other uh, major empirical social sciences. Among economists, we can see that in the bottom panel, the majority of forecasters are either development economists or behavioral economists, but there's a reasonable representation, again, of a, a few other major fields. So that's who the forecasters are. What are the benefits of developing a platform? Why did we develop this platform? A first reason has to do with coordinated learning about forecasts. So the platform allows systematic and transcollection of forecasts and results in a way that would be hard to achieve uh, if individuals were independently collecting predictions. The platform is systematic in the sense that we automatically have a lot of really valuable metadata on each of the studies and each of the outcomes that are being predicted. So we have things like the, uh, the standard deviation of the outcomes that are being predicted, information on the types of questions that are being predicted. And within the platform, we also internally collect information on the results of the studies when the studies are complete. And the platform's transparent in the sense that we provide public information on each study. For example, let's say that you're interested in documenting whether your predictions were collected before experimental results were known. Well, you can include this information when you're, when you're registering your study and you can uh, host on a, on a permanent study page on the platform this information and other information about, about your study. So we try and make this uh, a fairly transparent process where we can have a clear idea of what is being predicted and when it's being predicted. A second benefit of the platform has to do with tracking forecasts. So because we're a platform, we have this rich panel data um, that we will develop over time on the performance of forecasters across many surveys. And this is something that would obviously be very challenging to do if individuals were just independently collecting predictions. This will help us to answer questions like, who makes accurate predictions? For example, is it more junior or more senior researchers that make accurate predictions? And you can imagine a number of other uh, interesting questions that this panel data will allow us to explore in some detail. Finally, the fact that we have this rich panel data on the accuracy of predictions uh, allows the possibility of identifying super forecasters. So in the geopolitical forecasting work by Phil Tetlock and uh, Don Moore at Haas and many others, uh, they've been able to identify individuals that have consistently accurate predictions of geopolitical events. It would be obviously very valuable if we could identify this type of individual in uh, the social science context. A third benefit of the platform 
has to do with making it easier for teams to collect predictions. We provide tools that I'll be discussing uh, in a bit more detail in the coming slides, such as automatic feedback. So if you're a researcher and you want to provide feedback, personalized feedback to your forecasters, well, this is, this is quite challenging. And we allow, uh, through the platform, uh, the, the possibility to automatically provide feedback, personalized feedback to the individuals that complete your forecasting survey. We also provide a default pool of respondents um, where you can uh, passively collect predictions through a prediction dashboard, and we allow many distribution options. So you can collect predictions from this default pool through via email, via Twitter. I'll be talking more about these uh, in detail soon. The fact that we're a centralized platform also allows the possibility for kind of coordinated learning from many different surveys. So we've, uh, we've created this survey guide, which includes feedback from the, the many users and forecasters on things that they like, things that they don't like, things that went right and wrong across the, the surveys that we've run so far. And this is, I think, a, another big benefit of this kind of coordinated centralized platform is that we can um, kind of collect and coordinate this, this learning about what types of surveys seem to work well. A final benefit of the platform has to do with making it easier for people to provide forecasts. So if you were to create an account right now, within a minute or two, you would have um, the, you'd be able to view this, this prediction dashboard. This is um, basically a list of all of the open and available surveys. You could provide forecasts to those surveys. And one, one kind of interesting uh, result that I wanted to highlight is there actually seems to be uh, a lot of interest from platform users in terms of providing more predictions. So usually it's researchers that have to kind of go and find forecasters. Through the platform, we allow forecasters to find studies that they're interested in themselves and provide predictions. So we uh, registered users that we have so far, about three quarters of users say that they either want to be emailed every time a new forecasting survey is published, or they want to receive weekly or monthly digests on um, new surveys that have been posted on the website. Only a quarter of individuals say, no more emails, please. So most individuals seem to be interested in taking more of these surveys. So now I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about the forecasting guide that we've developed. Again, the idea behind this guide is to provide a list of kind of tips and pieces of uh, advice and feedback that we've developed uh, from the experiences and from the uh, responses that we've gotten from the studies that we've run on the platform so far. There are obviously many categories here and I won't have time to talk about all of these. I'm just going to highlight a few, a few sections of the forecasting guide. So a first section of the, of the guide has to do with Qualtrics tips. As I mentioned, the platform runs on Qualtrics. And so when you create a survey and upload a survey, it's all done through Qualtrics. And we've been able to identify a, a, number, of, um, a number of useful pieces of, of feedback from the surveys that have been run so far. So let me just mention two of these tips that might be especially salient to forecasting surveys. One has to do with bounding numeric entries. So let's say that you're interested in um, you've pre-registered that you'll be focusing on the mean forecast from your forecasting survey. Well, that's going to be sensitive to outliers. This might make it especially relevant to provide bounds to the, uh, the responses that forecasters are allowed to provide. A second issue has to do with slider scales. So many, many forecasters, uh, or sorry, many researchers choose to elicit forecasts using a slider scale here. And they choose to center the slider scale at zero. So the default might be in the context of, a, of, of the prediction of a causal effect might be no impact. Depending on the number of decimal places that you allow in the slider scale, you may not be able to center the slider at true zero. So if you, in this example, 
have three decimal places, the slider will be centered either at 0 0.001 or at negative 0 0.001, not at that true zero. And so this could introduce a, a sign error um, in, in terms of people that are trying to write predictions of zero. So these are obviously, you know, they're, they're small tips and we include many more of these tips in the Qualtrics tips section of the guide. Two more sections in the guide that I want to highlight um, also relate to the Qualtrics, um, the Qualtrics survey. So a uh, first has to do with a Qualtrics template. We provide a template survey that includes many of the, uh, the tips that we have included in, uh, in the Qualtrics tips section of the guide. This is basically a QSF file, a Qualtrics survey file that you can download, you can modify it. Many, um, many of the projects so far have worked off of this template in developing their own surveys. Um, so this hopefully is a, it will, will save a good deal of time when you're developing your surveys. Um, we also have provided annotated surveys that, uh, so these are basically Qualtrics surveys where we have provided annotated um, comments on the pieces of the survey that we think are, um, are doing something especially well. So these are kind of desirable features of the survey here as an example, a team has decided to provide a link to a pre-analysis plan, um, which can be useful if you don't want to provide, you know, a, a 20 page description of the study in your survey, you can just link to the pre-analysis plan. And so we have these kind of annotated surveys. You can view the annotated surveys. You can also uh, take those surveys um, to view as examples. Um, so hopefully these, these will help teams develop their forecasting surveys. A final feature that I want to mention is multiple distribution options. So I had mentioned that one benefit of the platform is that we have this, this pool of 2,300 users. And if you choose to um, host a survey on the platform, you can kind of passively collect predictions from these users. But many teams want to reach out through kind of more traditional mechanisms um, to, uh, to contact forecasters. So the platform allows kind of simultaneous uh, collection of predictions through a number of different mechanisms. You could, for example, collect predictions passively through our pool. You can also distribute emails to uh, a list of individuals that you're interested in contacting. You can upload a list of email addresses. You can write a customized email to those individuals and the platform will distribute those emails. You can also have anonymous links that you can share over Twitter or through uh, whatever other avenues that you want to use. And we, we have a duplicate function in the survey, or sorry, on the platform that allows you to track these different survey options. So we, we kind of make it easy for teams to collect predictions in multiple ways and to track who is coming from which distribution option. So that's an overview of the platform. If you're interested in collecting forecast for a study, you can easily submit a project directly through the platform. If you have any questions, maybe about a, a project you're interested in collecting forecasts for, maybe it's a broader question about the platform or um, about a feature that you'd like to see, please feel free to, uh, to reach out to us either through our social science prediction email or you can email me personally. Thank you. Thank you, Nick, so much for that introduction. Um, and now, uh, Eva Vivalt, who is uh, kind of my co-PI on the, on the project, I'm proud to introduce her. She will um, talk about a specific project uh, that uh, she ran on the platform. Uh, thank you, Eva. OK, hi. Uh, can you see my slides? Yes. Great, super. Um, so. This was one of the early projects on the platform. Uh, this is joint with Aidan Koval of the World Bank. Um, we're looking at how policymakers are weighing evidence. And 
Um, in particular, there's two things we're trying to tease out here. So first, how they're weighing impact evaluation results versus maybe more informal advice that they might get from a local expert. Um, oftentimes, you're not going to have an impact evaluation result, so we wanted to see sort of how they might make these trade-offs. Um, and then even within impact evaluation results, there could be different attributes of a study that we don't know exactly how they're going to um, trade off these different attributes. So for example, <clears throat> you could have, you can imagine there's two programs. One of them has got an impact evaluation that was done in your context, like exactly your context, but the sample size is really small and maybe it was observational. Uh, so you're really not sure how much to trust it. On the other hand, there's maybe a program somewhere else that um, it's not in your context. Maybe it was implemented by a small NGO, um, but it was evaluated by a randomized controlled trial and it has you know large sample size, very precise. So how do you trade off these different factors, which you can loosely think of as, you know, weighing internal validity versus external validity, right? So um, it's a kind of big area. There's actually not that many papers, though, that have uh, studied it to date, apart from a, really, a few really great ones that I've listed here. Um, I think the main uh, challenge is that it's difficult to survey policymakers. You can't really bring them to a lab. Uh, so what we did was we brought the lab to them. Uh, we're leveraging uh, these uh, workshops that the World Bank and the Inter-American Development Bank put on. Um, and um, so it's a really simple discrete choice experiment. People see some short description of two programs. So the program A here, for example, had a study that uh, was observational. It was done in the target country. Um, it found relatively high impacts, but with a lot of variance there, um, as opposed to program B, well, okay, that's experimental, but it was done somewhere else. It maybe had a lower estimate and it, it, it was very precise. So how do you trade those two things off? And in addition, you're told a local expert that, uh, said that they believe program A will do better in your context. So which program then do you recommend? So that was the little exercise that we had them do. And you can imagine, even though this is all hypothetical, if you ask people to do this quite a bit, I mean, hopefully we get some sense of how they're making these trade-offs. Uh, these are the attributes and levels in the discrete choice experiment. Um, Quasi-experimental here, we defined beforehand for them. So you can think of this as, you know, your um, not RCT, but maybe it's uh, difference and difference or regression discontinuity is somewhere in between um, on the scale of, you know, uh, rigorous impact evaluation results, you know, somewhere in between there. Um, and so, you know, we've got location, impact, confidence interval, and whether or not it was recommended by a local expert. So, this was just done at a few conferences. Um, they were all over the world. Um, they attracted people from all over the world. Uh, what I mean here by policymakers, this is not like you're really, uh, you know, top of the line. This is not like somebody who's like the minister of health, but it could be somebody who works in the ministry of health. It's uh, some bureaucrat in charge of a particular program with signing power over it, um, or possibly somebody in the ministry who is involved with monitoring and evaluation. So there's those two types of bureaucrats, essentially. And then for practitioners, by what, I'm, what I mean there is um, World Bank staff or Inter-American Development Bank staff, pretty much. There's a couple of NGO uh, practitioners in there, too. Um, so briefly, the results, this is just from a conditional logit. Um, and if you just sort of look at the pooled column here, um, so the policymakers cared a lot about whether a program sort of came recommended. <laughs> um, and that's also the case both at the World Bank really and at the IDB. The World Bank is not significant, but you'll notice in magnitudes, it's the largest of all the um, ones that they you know selected. And it's similar, there's there's some similarities between actually how the policymakers and practitioners answered at the World Bank versus at the IDB. Um, generally, you know, if uh, the policymaker put more weight on it seemingly than the practitioner. That seems to be the case in both of those things, right? Um, they also cared a lot about impact. Um, practitioners also cared about impact. They cared about as well the where it was done and what methods it used, whether it was an RCT. Um, and they also cared about precision. Now, just for this particular audience, um, I 
added a extra little row here. This is not a thing that we initially uh, were planning on. So just flagging that up front transparently, but the significant essentially, you know, the interaction between the impact um, and uh, the small confidence interval, whether, you know, it the confidence interval essentially included zero or not. Um, so here, you know, yes, it does seem to be driving a lot of those results. Um, um, so just putting that in because I thought that would be interesting for this group. Um, okay, so moving on to forecasting. So we did do a forecasting survey for this. It was open on the social science prediction platform between July uh, 8th and August 17th. Um, you'll notice that was actually after we did the initial discrete choice experiment. However, you know, usually you would want to do it beforehand. Um, I will say there are two things that I think made this okay. Uh, one is that, um, first of all, we had not shared any results from it beforehand, nothing written, nothing in presentations, like nothing. Um, second, we didn't, we we're not sharing it because we didn't fully know all the results ourselves. We were waiting on a roster from the World Bank of um, the participants because we had some criteria that we wanted to use to exactly classify who we were considering a policymaker, who we were considering a practitioner. So we had some idea of the results. We didn't have the full results. Um, obviously, you know, it's better the earlier you can do. Um, but uh, I mean, the platform wasn't really uh, functional at the time we did this. And yeah, so it is what it is, uh, but nothing was um, out there at that time. So we recruited participants through three mechanisms, uh, first by targeted emails, also through a survey link uh, shared on Twitter and also passively through the platform. We mostly focused on getting responses from researchers um, and got 159 responses. Um, we did also get some from, especially from the World Bank um, and a few other um, places like that. So um, you'll ask, well, how can we get people to predict the results of a conditional logit? What? I mean, that's going to be really hard. <laughs> um, so we can't exactly ask people to predict, you know, the output of those regression tables I was showing you. But what we could do is try to simplify it um, and sort of collapse it down a bit. So first of all, we had the researchers go through the exercise themselves um, to try to you know, understand it a bit better. And also because that um, got us, you know, how the researchers themselves would select um, the, you know, based on the different attributes of the study. Um, so then we uh, framed it like this. Um, if a practitioner observed that program B had an estimated impact of 10 percentage points and program A had an estimated impact of zero percentage points, and you know nothing else about <clears throat> excuse me, which other characteristics were associated with each of these two programs, what percent of the time do you think a practitioner would choose program B? Okay, and, and we made clear, look, um, you know, if you don't care about impact at all, you're just sort of uh, picking randomly, you're going to pick program B 50% of the time. Um, even if you care extremely a lot about impact, you're unlikely to really uh, pick it 100% of the time because there are all these other attributes. So, you know, the program that has seemingly the best impact might also have that impact from an observational study, which is really imprecise, done somewhere else, like all the, you know, other things that we would think that people are selecting away from. Um, so generally, we would expect these responses to fall between 50 and 100% of the time. Um, and so then we had this little slider bar. We, we did allow people to um, give responses that we would think um, worked the opposite way to how we were thinking of it ourselves. So, you know, we allowed the, the possibility somebody says, no, impact is bad. <laughs> um, and um, if we had this uh, click here for more information, so you can, you know, pull up the uh, full information from the other slides. I think that's generally speaking a pretty useful thing to do just as a tip. <laughs> um, people are not going to necessarily remember all the bits of um, what you had previously told them. And here are some results. Um, so here's how you read this. So on the y axis, you've got um, the uh, predicted uh, percent of the time they selected a certain thing. And on the x-axis, how the observed percent of the time they selected that thing. So the orange triangles, those are the policymakers, the uh, blue squares, those are the researchers. 
And let's look at, say, the blue square on the far top right under impact over there, right? Okay. Um, so that's saying that, you know, the researchers predicted that maybe 76 or so percent of the time uh, they would choose the thing that had uh, 10 percentage points higher impact. In reality, if you sort of drop down the vertical there, um, maybe 79, almost 80 percent of the time they chose that option. Um, if you are uh, sort of going top down here, so you can th see, think of this as like, okay, the first thing, the thing that researchers thought would be most important is that a study not be observational, okay? And the second most important thing to them would be that it's an RCT. Um, and then that it has a small uh, confidence interval that's really precise. Um, the very last thing that they thought um, that uh, you know they would select on would be whether it was recommended by a local expert. Um, but if you actually look rather than top down, you go right to left in this figure, you can see that's the third <laughs> uh, thing actually, that first they selected on impact, then it not being observational and it you know being recommended by a local expert. Um, still, you can sort of see that these things are pretty correlated. Um, so, you know, actually the researchers predicted um, relatively, the, the ranks at least better for the policymakers than they did for themselves. Um, the main gap was that uh, the researchers thought that the policymakers and researchers would behave more differently than they did. Um, both of the groups really valued impact as well as whether the program came recommended. So that was interesting and sort of added a dimension to the paper that it didn't previously have. Um, Overall, in terms of platform experience, I'd say I found it really easy to get researcher forecasts. Um, the hard part um, is really trying to explain the study concisely so that people are still paying attention and really able to get it um, very quickly while still providing all the information that the forecasters needed to know. And I think that's going to be a pretty common experience um, that people have had. Um, I also personally found it nice to be able to cite the survey. Um, you know, and it sort of actually still lives on the site, so you can go and click on it and see exactly what people answered. Uh, or not what people answered, but so what, not the individuals, uh, but what you can see is, uh, so if you gave the forecast, you can uh, see the results, which I input later, but also you can see what the forecasting survey itself was. You can download the QSF file. So um, I thought that was kind of nice. I don't have to maintain it myself personally. I mean, you know, one can, one can, but I don't have to. Um, just in the last couple of minutes, I want to briefly flag a project that will be on the platform soon, which is uh, this project, which is a little bit different, which is also why I'm flagging it. It's about forecasting models. Um, so we've been talking a lot about uh, different types of things you can forecast. You could even sort of forecast which models are going to perform best. So this is a large collaboration with a big group of people here. Um, and there's two steps in this process. So first, we're crowdsourcing models. So if you click this link, um, it should be clickable. You can actually go and see a whole different site uh, that was sort of set up that you can enter a model. There's a bunch of data that uh, we collected um, and you can uh, essentially predict COVID-19 deaths as of a certain point in time in the future. Um, and you can do this uh, globally as well as subnationally for a few different places. So the US, Mexico, India, um, you can you know uh, try to predict regional variation. And um, this is using uh, social science types of variables. We're also including epidemiological controls in there. And we're using the first step just to crowdsource the models. Um, and we're then going to put them all into a meta model and weight them uh, by uh, how they um, perform. So essentially how much uniqueness they're contributing to the model. So if you think of like a linear regression, for example, and you've got two variables that are highly correlated, they're not contributing very much that's unique. We're placing for more weight on the unique factors in this meta model. Um, so check out the uh, um, crowdsourcing models project if you want. We're incentivizing it by saying uh, people who submit a good model can actually gain co-authorship. And I think at this point, especially for some of the uh, lesser predicted or you know lesser um, submitted model places like um, India, Mexico, that should be pretty 
easy to do, but it probably even for the US for some of you guys. So, um, you know, feel free to check it out. Then the second stage after, so this was just to crowdsource the models. Why are we doing the models separately? Well, we want to have a comprehensive set. So then the second stage, we can forecast them on the platform and I have people like assign weights to them. So here's just, you know, an example. It's illustrative because we don't have all the models yet, right? And we don't know which ones we're going to be putting in, but essentially asking people to forecast how much weight they, you know, would put on each of these kinds of models, okay? So that'll be the second step later on. So I'm out of time. I'll just, you know, link again to the uh, social science prediction platform, and there's my contact information if you want to follow up. Thanks. Eva, thank you so much for the clear presentation highlighting also different uses of the platform and some have come up in the chat. So we'll get back to that in the Q&A time in the last 10 minutes. Um, we're pleased to have next uh, Aaron Advani who will tell us about his project and then uh, we'll go to Q&A. Thank you. Great. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, so I'll talk about quite a different project and uh, yet another way of using the platform. So this is uh, work with Elliot Ash and David Kaya, uh, David Kaya ETH Zurich and Imran Rasul at UCL. We were interested uh, in understanding uh, how much economists work on race related issues and uh, how much we know about what we do in terms of race related issues. So, you know, probably no surprise to anybody who's spent any time thinking about the news over the last nine months. But, you know, issues of racial justice have really come to the forefront of public debates with the killing of George Floyd and subsequent Black Lives Matter protests that started in the US, but really have spread worldwide. The discussions that are happening everywhere. And that actually led the profession to think about it very directly, uh, the Econ Econometric Society World Congress. There was a panel specifically on what can economics do for racial justice? Now there's an easy answer to that question. The easy answer to the question, what can we do is research it, publish about it, think about the causes and the consequences of racial inequality. But we wanted to understand how much are we doing this already? We, there's just, it wasn't it was sort of not immediately obvious to us. You know, what, where are we now? What's the, what does the, the status quo look like? And so for the research questions for this uh, specific um, project was, you know, how much are economists already doing uh, this kind of research, thinking about race? Uh, I, I, depending on where you are in the world, some people use race, people, some people use ethnicity. So in Europe, or at least in the UK, ethnicity is typically what's discussed, but in a US audience, I'm told that race is, the, is a more natural word to use. Um, but if I, if I use ethnicity, I mean it uh, kind of completely in parallel. Um, but how much uh, economists are already uh, thinking about race? Uh, how much, how do we compare uh, to other disciplines in the social sciences? And how much do we know about what we do? And it's the third part of it uh, for which the social science prediction platform was really useful to us uh, as a way to understand what do we think we are doing? This is, I should, say, I should flag this is kind of part of a wider project uh, that's looking at what topics uh, economists study within uh, issues around race, uh, what are the incentives to work on race, uh, and how do those uh, issues influence selection of minorities into economics. And so there's a kind of wider project doing that, uh, but there's this kind of smaller piece that we spun out uh, focused on uh, what we did for the, for the uh, World Congress. So to understand the first two parts of these questions, we wanted to know, you know how much do economists study uh, race and how much do other uh, social sciences do that? We decided to pick a social sciences that we'd compare to political science and sociology. Uh, and so we kind of pulled the full uh, corpus that we could get of publications across these three uh, disciplines. Uh, this is primarily from JSTOR, uh, where it's all kind of fairly straightforward and automated to download it. Uh, there's a, a link to the paper, I think, in the, in the OSF uh, thing that goes with these presentations. And you can, in there, we, we detail exactly how to do it if you wanted to do this yourself. Um, but we, we use that as our baseline, and then we supplement it with the Web of Science and Scopus uh, to, to cover a couple of key gaps. So one is JSTOR uh, data uh, aren't the most updated, and so you can't get the most recent years from JSTOR. Uh, the other is there are a couple of key journals that we thought were really important to have that we couldn't get from JSTOR. So the J General Public Economics was one of them. Uh, and so again, we supplemented them uh, externally. All the details for exactly which journals come from where and what periods are all kind of listed in the paper. Um, we actually go back as far as 1880, um, but for the, for the graphs I'll show you today, we'll only show you from 1960 because otherwise it sort of squashes everything too much. Um, but you can go you can go back all the way to 1880 when the first uh, econ journals are available. Um, and what we collect uh, from these uh, different uh, different sources is the title and abstract of all publications, the journal in which the publication was published, uh, and the year of publication. Uh, and so we use that uh, as the kind of corpus on which we're going to look at. Uh, papers that are race related. So what do we mean by race related and how are we going to measure it? Um, 
we use an algorithmic approach to classify uh, the articles that would clearly take uh, too long to be able to go through these things manually and figure out uh, what these things look like individually. Uh, and so we'll define an article as race related if one of two criteria are met. Either the title itself contains uh, what we call a group keyword. So we have a list uh, of all of the kind of group keywords we use, um, but these would be African American, Black, other synonyms uh, for that category, similarly uh, Hispanic, Latino, other synonyms for that category. Uh, and then we sort of go through and list out a, a long list of categories, trying to be as comprehensive as we can. We actually have, um, because there are sort of different, depending on where you are in the world, there are different ideas of which groups uh, are the most likely to kind of show up in some sense. Uh, we actually use three different bands uh, for robustness. At the most basic level, we have a, a lower band that considers only uh, where words like race specifically, kind of general group keywords are used. So race, racial, uh, other synonyms there. Then we have a kind of what we think of as our main specification, which is sort of the US band effectively. So it includes those keywords. It also includes uh, black and, and uh, synonyms, Native American and synonyms, uh, Hispanic and synonyms. Uh, and then we have a kind of global uh, approach where we think of what are the minority groups uh, that are picked up in other countries as well. Um, and so, you know, in, in other countries, there are other groups that would become, the, would feel like the more natural uh, ethnic minorities uh, to study. So there's either the title contains that uh, or the title and abstract collectively contain both the group keyword, uh, so one of those ones we just described, and also an issue keyword, where we list out a bunch of issues that we think fit into uh, kind of race-related topics. The reason for doing that is if you include something like black just in the um, abstract, you get a lot of black markets, uh, and you have a similar kind of problem with uh, if you look at things, something like if you just if you just have issue keywords, so you think of something like bias, you end up with a lot of econometrics papers. So trying to narrow down to the set of things that we think are actually uh, relevant, uh, we combine these two things. We did, we did a bit of testing um, beforehand to look at uh, across a, along a very small sample uh, that we, we kind of pre-planned with just to look at you know, what looked sensible. And we then ran that across the uh, entire, uh, in, in entire corpus that we had. Uh, in our main specification, we also exclude the last sentence of the abstract. And that's basically just to remove these papers that are say a labor economics paper that isn't really interested in race particularly, but at the end says, by the way, the same results hold for black people or don't hold. Uh, and that we don't think of that as a study that's about uh, racial issues, particularly that sort of a robustness check. Um, we do also have a version where we include those things. Uh, I won't show you those today. For today, I'll just show you the main specification, uh, but in the paper, we have the results, including uh, all these different versions. Uh, so I said already, uh, we include these different bands uh, to define things. We also, uh, account for false positives and false negatives that might show up in this case, so things like this black market type issue, um, by taking a sample of a thousand papers that we manually classified uh, and looking at what uh, false positive and false negative rates were to kind of set bounds on uh, what seems plausible uh, as, the, as the rates uh, elsewhere, again, details in the paper. So okay, let's uh, first think about comparing economics to other disciplines. So this first graph is just showing you the total number of publications in a given year uh, across these three disciplines, economics, political science, and sociology. What you can see is that economics, you know, in, in the more recent period, publishes far and away more uh, articles than in other, the, other, the other two disciplines do. Um, the other two are kind of similar to each other. There's a bit of a drop off in the recent years, as I say, because the JSTOR uh, doesn't have as good coverage in the recent years. And we don't, we don't try and fill out every single journal. We fill out uh, kind of top, top journals, uh, kind of the kind of most well-known ones, uh, but we don't try and go all the way down and cover everything because it's a, costly process to do it uh, manually in, in the web of science. Uh, when you look at the number of race related articles, on the other hand, uh, you get quite a different uh, pattern. So economics is uh, down at the bottom end of, the, of these three disciplines, uh, really is kind of falling behind uh, even political science at this point, even though it's you know, publishing a lot more uh, at, at, in an absolute terms. Uh, and so when you look at the shares, what you see is that economics is flattish uh, for the last forever essentially at a bit less than two percent uh political science does about twice publishes about twice as much on race as we do uh, about four percent uh and sociology was twice as much again uh in the older period uh, before 1990 and it's since increased to more like 12 percent uh, so economists study uh race much less than other disciplines now at this point we can't say whether that's a kind of good thing or a bad thing but it's useful to have a benchmark when, when we say economists you know, 2% of what we write is about race in some sense. We want some kind of benchmark to get a sense for, you know, what, what seems sensible, what do other, what do other disciplines do? Uh, and so this is one way of thinking about, well, what, what could we be doing? Um, 
where do we publish? Uh, so first, just looking at the aggregate numbers, because I found this really instructive. And I just, I find it so instructive that I just feel like sharing it to people even when it feels like not the most relevant thing to tell you. In, in a full year, the top five together have never managed to get 10 articles on race in any given year. Like if you think of the kind of the sum of all additions to human knowledge that economists have produced on uh, race, where we are now is where, if you collect it across all, all journals, where we are now is where sociology was by 1980. So we're kind of 40 years behind uh, in, in our production in terms of our individual contributions to human knowledge, counting up articles sort of one by one. You can also then kind of look at where they're publishing. Uh, so, so this is kind of what we're doing here. And the top five uh, aren't publishing loads individually. That said, as a share of publications, the top five actually in the more recent period are publishing a higher share of uh, work on race related issues than uh, the rest of the discipline as a whole. Uh, so it used to be that, I mean, the non top five has kind of always been around 2%, it's sort of declined a bit. Uh, the top five were uh, until the mid 90s kind of further below, but they since uh, increased as partly uh, due to the increase in the number of papers that AER publishes. In fact, the AER uh, is kind of up there in terms of publishing on this issue, but uh, yeah, it is what it is. So then, you know, what does the social science prediction platform gives us on, give us on this? Uh, it allows us to understand whether economists know what we just, what I've just shown you. You know, if we think this is, might be a problem, you know, maybe all economists are aware of this. We all think this is totally fine. This is exactly the group we want to be in. Uh, and, you know, if that were the case, then, you know, we can try and have a conversation about why we think it ought to be different, but at least everyone is, is walking in with their eyes open. But we want to understand, is that the world we live in or is, is the world we live in actually quite a different one where we actually don't even realize that this is where we are? Uh, and so we found, we, we thought of using the social science prediction platform to understand what do economists think. And we wanted to understand both what academics think uh, and what policymakers think, because they rely on us to some extent uh, to, to be producing research that they can use for, for various purposes. So when we're thinking about issues of racial justice, where we started, uh, you know, they're, they're looking to us to kind of give, give them some answers. So, you know, just in terms of how to use, I actually won't say very much about how to use, uh, use the SSPP because it's been discussed plenty, um, but we uh, recruited academics via emails directly to various lists and to Twitter, uh, and we got public sector economists via emails to the UK Government Economic Service and to the Bank of England, uh, who have internal mailing lists that we got access to for this purpose. Uh, and in a period of 10 days that we had in the mad rush before the uh, Econometric Society World Congress, uh, we got 240 responses from economists. We also, I should say, got 56 responses from other people who, because it was available on Twitter, could just fill in the survey. Uh, we weren't against that happening. It's useful to see that. Because it's such a small sample and they're very heterogeneous in terms of the type of people who are answering it, there's not much we can, uh, can do that. We focused on uh, the responses from the economists uh, as what we, what we were always intending to look at and what we focus on. Um, so what do the economists say? This is pooling uh, the, the academics and the policymakers. There's actually not a lot of difference between them. Um, but you know what do we see? Uh, we get so the, the the black lines here are showing you the truth, and the uh, box whisker plots are showing you medians, interquartile range, and ten to ninety uh, percentile ranges. Economists get the direction right. We all get that sociology is going to pr produce more than political science, and that's going to produce more than economics. Uh, we're over optimistic, however, in how much all of these things are doing. So the medians are all definitely above uh, the truth, and we're actually most optimistic about our own profession. So we're actually not that far off for sociology. We're kind of far off for political science. We are way out for economics. We're, you know, the, the truth is below the 10th percentile of what people suggest. The median is four times the truth. Um, so we really don't understand where we are right now. And that I think you know, is striking as, as a kind of problem for us as a field if we don't understand even what we are doing in the first place. In terms of looking at uh, where we publish this material, um, unfortunately, we also get that wrong. Um, so. Again, here's the, here the black lines of the truth. This is showing you uh, between 1980. So we, we also asked about past to present, which I haven't focused on for today. Um, but we kind of asked people to compare what used to happen the 20 years before 2000, the 20 years from 2000, and then in the 20 years from 2000 uh, in the top five. Uh, looking at this comparison, which is what I've been talking to you about today, uh, we get the direction wrong. Uh, and so this is, you can see this kind of from these aggregate figures. When you look at the individual level, 80% of people reckon the top five uh, has fewer, has a lower share of uh, race-related publications than particular field, some field journal in, that they imagine, basically, when they compare to everything else, uh, which is the wrong direction. Um, so we're actually kind of closer on the top five numbers, but mainly because we just get the direction wrong. So uh, to sort of wrap up on race-related research, economics produces much less 
race related research than comparable social sciences. Um, when we do produce it, it's slightly more in the top five than other journals, but it's partly because it's not very much anywhere. Um, but I think most strikingly, we're least well informed about our own discipline uh, in terms of uh, what we're doing. Uh, I should give a plug to the social science prediction platform for you know huge amounts of support in the in the mad rush in which we you know it was right when the program, when the platform had gone live and we were one of the first things to go onto it. Uh, and so huge thanks to Eva and Nick who both put loads of effort in to try and help us get everything live. Uh, and yeah, we got, we got 240 responses in the 10 days. It's really easy to use. Uh, and it's not just for forecasting experiments. So thanks very much. Great, thank you so much, Aaron. And thanks all of you for <clears throat> both the content, the staying in time. Uh, one thing which is really useful about the mix of the two presentations, you will see that what can be forecast is, is quite different, can be a summary statistic, like what is the ratio of articles that have to do with race, or it can be something more complicated like, uh, you know, what would be sort of the coefficient in a logic model, like the, the idea more of what Eva is talking about, or, or it can be a treatment effect. Like, so it's just uh, all of those. Um, now, um, maybe we can start from one of the questions uh, that came up in the, in the thread above. I think people can also um, raise their hand and we can unmute them. Um, one question asked briefly, I can just respond. Uh, can this be forecast be used as an alternative null to test against? Exactly. So in, in a way, uh, you might be able to test against both the typical null of zero, but sometimes you're like, actually people are not expecting zero, but you can like expose say, oh, we, we think people think 3%, expose is too late, but if you collected ex ante taking the mean of the forecast, that's essentially what Arun, Arun did uh, by saying, this is the median of the predictions and you can compare to that. So we can show that you're out and that also should kind of lower the share of studies at a null effect. Um, one question I thought Eva would be in a great position to address is a question by uh, Daniel Stein uh, reading. Um, I was surprised that one of the reasons for this isn't to create priors so that people can conduct Bayesian analysis. Are some of the researchers doing that uh, given Eva's done some of Bayesian work, maybe she can speak a little bit about this. And then if people want to raise hand or ask questions, that would be great. Yeah, Dan, great question. Um, I really appreciate that kind of question. Um, so yeah, I think, um, you know, you might be aware of, for example, some of Rachel Meager and Dave McKenzie's work that have been trying to, you know, gather forecasts um, to use them in a Bayesian way. Um, that was actually, I think, pre the platform. So I'm hopeful that um, as things go on, that other researchers who want to do Bayesian analysis will use the platform to get their priors for that. I would find it super useful for that purpose, potentially in the future so yeah um i think we've sort of yet to see all of the use cases for the platform and that's fine and that's good like i hope that people sort of discover new things we, can, we can't for um you know forecast all the uses ourselves ironically so um yeah i hope to see more work there great thank you eva um fernando do you want to ask your question about comparing to the igm panel uh, yeah, I, I was just curious. The the the, the AGM both panel has like, sort of like the, I think it's like forty experts or something like that. Uh, ha have any of you thought about kind of like contrasting it with what uh, academics say, with what students something like that? Um, yeah. Nick, do you want to take that in order, you know, to kind of vary the people answering? Yeah, yeah. Um, so we, I, I think that that would be a, a, a good fit for the platform. We haven't, um, we haven't kind of thought about doing that yet. Um, but yeah, it would be very interesting. You know, there's, with the platform, there's, there's a potential issue of, of selection. Who are the individuals that are kind of opting in to participate on the platform? And yeah, I think it's, it's, it would be very interesting to see how these uh, how the, the platform participants compare to uh, kind of people that are maybe traditionally viewed as um, as experts. I think kind of adding to that, in a sense, there is um, the the IGM tends to ask questions that are more qualitative, like what do you expect? You expect the minimum wage increase would you know lead to significant loss of jobs, do you agree or not? And I think 
um, the platform tends to put uh, to come out with exact numbers. Um, so, and then th so that would be one way that we sort of um, try to. Uh, th that's one difference, kind of the degree of, of precision. The, the, the other thing that, they, that the AGM does is that they ask how confident they are. And in that sense, basically, you, you don't need to ask your the, the people in the, in, the, in the platform how confident they are. You just need to look at the, at the distribution of responses so that you can, you can kind of sort of like map in some sense yeah, their interpretation of confidence that. with with, uh, with what the crowd says. Yeah, so right now, um, for the ones that have results, you can actually sort of see the distribution um, that people um, forecast um, without, you know, knowing who gave which forecast, you can see the distribution, you can also sort of see where your prediction fell in that distribution and where the truth was. So that's a little bit nice, um, and a little bit analogous, I think, in some respects. Um, we were thinking also of uh, confidence uh, questions right now that's sort of open to the research teams who are, you know, if you want to ask questions about confidence, um, you can do that, like it's a, actually, you know, um, pretty open to anything at the moment. And we were thinking that, uh, you know, it's possible that in the future, once more people sort of are collecting forecasts and sort of are aware of the platform and are more familiar with it and comfortable with it and know how to do it very well, then at that point, we might sort of nudge people a little bit more to <laughs> also say something about their confidence or at least, you know, allow that option uh, to be collected more systematically. And kind of on that, I, I want to flag the Nico just talked a little bit about the guide, which uh, I think he especially put a lot of time in. There is questions like, how would I ask a confidence question? Like, is there a difference in using um, a slider scale or having a, a kind of tight response? And between what we've done on the platform and not between kind of the three of us, let's say we've run like maybe 10 such prediction studies and we keep learning. So we've tried to convey our best um, you know, kind of state of your knowledge in that. So I, hopefully that is also something that is, that is useful. Uh, David Bernard, if I say, do you want to unmute to ask your question? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, yeah, I guess I was just curious, yeah, whether in peer review we have norms that like yeah you should review things three or four times for each submission you make are you expecting to like develop similar norms around forecasting as well so i, I think that to a large degree this depends on kind of what you're planning on using the forecast for so if you're just interested in um getting a prediction of a mean and you're not interested in kind of decomposing different dimensions of heterogeneity then you obviously um, forecast than if you're trying to kind of split up the predictions of, of different groups. Um, so it's, you know, it's, it kind of needs to be tailored a little bit to the, the uses of, um, of, the, of the predictions. And it also, I think, depends on the elicitation method. So if you're, you know, if you're bounding people's predictions, and so there's like a, a relatively limited interval over which they can provide forecasts, then that's kind of more likely to converge quickly than if you have a, a, a very wide kind of numeric response that, that you allow. But I mean, I think broadly from the work that we've done so far, we, I at least have been surprised that it seems like predictions converge relatively quickly and getting, you know, 30 or 50 predictions is going to contain a lot of the information that you might get from a much larger sample. Yeah, I mean, if anything, I think we're trying to nudge people towards keeping things relatively small, not, you know, trying to get thousands of responses or anything like, like you know, keeping it relatively limited at first, I think would be, I mean, we, we want this to sort of grow in a sustainable way and for people to not be irritated. I mean, one of the advantages of the platform actually is that um, otherwise you can imagine, you know, I mean, forecasts are sort of taking off. People are collecting forecasts for their own projects. And if people are not doing them through the platform where you can say, hey, I only want to, you know, receive one digest a month or something, then you could end up with getting a lot of emails <laughs> and requests to do this. So we're hoping that this, you know, does help make it a little bit more sustainable as well.
And just to add and to wrap up the session on this theme, um, like we're thinking about, let's say, how many people you might explicitly ask and so on. Like if people are really excited about, say, how many mentions articles on race there in economics, that's wonderful. People can go, but it wasn't like 200 people were asked, but like people came in and asked, that's, that's fine. But uh, I think it should be when you're sort of contacting and asking people in particular, trying to stay within the 20 to 30 uh, range, I think we think that that would be something sustainable if people also do this themselves. Well, I, I want to, uh, mindful of time, I want to thank everybody for, for the session uh, and um, thank uh, Bits for, you know, putting together all these ads and, and for making headways on these issues as well as all the other transparency issues. Thank you.